Hello, thank you for joining me today. The title of this talk is In Vivo Estimation of Whole Cortex Excitation and Inhibition, an fMRI Perspective. The image shown here is the high vocal center tissue of a zebra finch imaged with electron microscopy. This photo shows an example of the distribution of excitatory and inhibitory synapses. In fact, people have observed that the densities of excitatory and inhibitory neurons are different across the cerebral cortex, with roughly 80% of the neurons are excitatory glutamatergic neurons, and 20% are inhibitory GABAergic neurons. Despite the differences of their density, the neuronal activities of excitatory and inhibitory neurons achieve a homeostatic balance, usually referred to as yi ratio balance. Here is a schematic showing the interactions of excitatory and inhibitory neurons. The shapes and colors of the arrows represent the type of connection. A red triangle denotes an excitatory connection, while a blue circle denotes an inhibitory connection. In particular, neuronal excitations are mainly mediated through NMDA and AMPA receptors, and inhibition through GABA receptors. Here are some waveforms showing the amplitude of excitatory postsynaptic current and inhibitory postsynaptic current of a pyramidal cell upon photoactivation. If we compare the amplitude of excitatory and inhibitory postsynaptic currents across the four pyramidal cells measured, it can be noticed that cells receiving larger excitation also receive larger inhibition, so overall the excitation and inhibition are balanced. If we plot the amplitude of excitatory and inhibitory postsynaptic current of the four pyramidal cells on a scatter plot, it can be noted that there is a positive linear relationship between them. If we compare the normalized values as well as their ratio or the EI ratio, we can observe that despite the excitatory and inhibitory postsynaptic current showing higher variability, the EI ratio shows a much smaller fluctuation again suggesting that there is a balance between neuronal excitation and inhibition. The linear relationship between excitation and inhibition still holds when considering the measurement from a larger sample of 51 pyramidal cells. On the other hand, if the brain fails to maintain the ER ratio balance, the disrupted ER ratio has been shown to associate with psychiatric disorders. For example, if we consider somatostatin or SST interneurons, which are responsible for mediating neuronal inhibition, and compare the mRNA level of SST between subjects diagnosed with schizophrenia and unaffected comparison subjects, there is generally lower levels of transcription per SST positive neuron for the schizophrenia subjects, suggesting that they might have lower level of inhibition or an elevated level of ER ratio than control subjects. Similarly, if we compare the ratio of cells expressing vesicular glutamate transporter and GABA transporter between control subjects and subjects diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, the cellular ER ratio was significantly higher in the AD group versus controls. Overall, this result suggests an association between disrupted ER ratio and psychiatric disorders but most of the evidence regarding ER ratio were either from invasive animal studies or post-mortem studies. Therefore, it's challenging to collect data in humans on a large scale unless there is a non-invasive approach. So for the rest of this talk, I will mainly focus on how to estimate ER ratio using functional magnetic resonance imaging or fMRI data. This video shows the spontaneous activity of a human brain imaged with functional MRI. The fluctuations of a signal reflect blood oxygenation level, which is associated with the underlying metabolic processes and the neuronal activities. In this talk, I will outline two different frameworks to estimate ER ratio in vivo by utilizing fMRI data. First, we have the neural mass model, which directly models the dynamics of neuronal excitation and inhibition. Secondly, I'll introduce a time series analysis, which can be used to estimate EI ratio based on the temporal features of fMRI data. Let me first start by introducing the neural mass model, 
Before the development of neural mass models, neuronal dynamics such as membrane potentials and firing rates are characterized by the spiking neural model, which consider each neuron as an individual unit. If we zoom in to a specific neuron, a neuron is typically modeled as a tiny electrical circuit with resistors, inductors, and capacitors. However, because each neuron is modeled individually, this setup poses a computational challenge when we want to scale up to the entire cerebral cortex with billions of coupled nonlinear differential equations for us to solve simultaneously. Therefore, it is necessary to reduce the system complexity via some form of approximation. One of the approaches is mean field reduction. The idea of mean field reduction was firstly introduced in statistical mechanics, where we reduce the system to a few but effective variables. Here, each small dot represents a single neuron. After applying the mean field reduction, the activities of a group of neurons can be reduced to the activities from a single unit. After mean field reduction, each brain region can be modeled with just two variables one for overall excitation and one for overall inhibition. Of course, the excitation and inhibition are not independent of each other. There are interactions or connections within a region and connections between different regions. In the next few slides, we will look at the definition of each type of connections and their functions. Again, the arrows with a red triangle represent an excitatory connection and a blue circle represents an inhibitory connection. The arrows highlighted here are external inputs that are not specifically modeled in our current cortical system. These excitatory external inputs typically represent inputs from subcortical regions. Next, there are four different types of local connections. First of all, we have the recurrent excitatory connections that are solely within the excitatory population. However, the strength of these connections are unknown parameters that can be optimized based on the empirical fMRI data, which I will introduce later. There are connections from inhibitory population to excitatory population, which function as an inhibitory or negative feedback to stabilize the excitatory activities. There are also recurrent self-inhibitions solely within the inhibitory populations. And the last type of local connections are the connections from excitatory population to inhibitory population. This is to prevent the inhibitory activities from dying down to zero over time. Lastly, the coupling between different regions are via the long-range connections of different excitatory populations. These long-range connections are typically defined by the structural connectivity, which represents the underlying white matter pathways. But so far, we have not yet provided a definition of ER ratio in the context of neural mass model. In order to define ER ratio, we need to introduce another variable, which is the synaptic gating variable. Synaptic gating variable represents the fraction of open receptor channels. And in the context of neural mass model, we are interested in the dynamics of synaptic gating variables. Based on its definition, the range of values of synaptic gating variable can only be between 0 and 1. There are two possible states of a channel. It can either be open or closed. Since synaptic gating variable S represents the fraction of open channels, we can use 1 minus S to represent the fraction of closed channels. Channels can switch between two different states, but the transition rates are different. And again, here we are interested in the dynamics or the rate of change of synaptic gating variable. First, the rate of change of synaptic gating variable from a closed state to an open state is proportional to the firing rate. The proportionality constant is denoted as alpha, and thus we have the first term in this form. In the opposite direction, but in a slightly different way, the rate of change of synaptic gating variable from an open state to a closed state is independent of firing rate. 
Instead, it's dependent on the inverse of a time constant. Thus, we have the second term in this form. Overall, this equation characterizes the dynamics of the synaptic gating variable. Here is a summary of the dynamics of synaptic gating variable for excited population and inhibitory population. These are the transition terms corresponding to the open to closed state transition. Recall that they are only dependent on the time constant. And these are the transition terms from closed state to open states, and they are proportional to the firing rate. Finally, we introduce some additive Gaussian noise for the stochasticity. We can now simulate this differential equation systems numerically and use it as a generative model to generate simulated time courses of neuronal activities for each cortical region I. Thus, for each cortical region, there are two time courses, one for SE and one for SI. The ER ratio can be defined as the ratio of temporal averages of these two time courses. Additionally, by taking the simulated time courses of an excitatory synaptic gating variable and passing through a hemodynamic model, we can obtain simulated fMRI both signals that will be utilized to optimize model parameters of the neural mass model. Recall that the neural mass model has unknown parameters such as the strength of local connections. Those parameters could be optimized by the empirical and simulated fMRI data. Next, I will introduce two metrics, functional connectivity and functional connectivity dynamics, that are used to optimize model parameters. The static functional connectivity is constructed by computing pairwise correlation of the fMRI time series. However, this assumes that the underlying functional connectivity does not change over time. Therefore, many studies have computed functional connectivity over short time windows. For example, here is a functional connectivity matrix computed using fMRI data during the short time window shown here. We can then slide the window and compute another functional connectivity matrix. Then we can continue sliding this window, resulting in many functional connectivity matrices. This is often referred to as time-varying functional connectivity or dynamic functional connectivity. But what can we do with so many matrices? For example, a very nice way to visualize this data is to compute correlations between all pairs of functional connectivity matrices, resulting in this matrix shown here. This is a T by T matrix, where T is the number of sliding windows. We call this the functional connectivity dynamics matrix. The diagonals of the functional connectivity dynamics matrix are high because of the autocorrelation of the fMRI data. What is very intriguing are these off-diagonal blocks of recurring functional connectivity patterns. We can use the empirical functional connectivity and functional connectivity dynamics to inform the neural mass model and to optimize the model parameters. To illustrate the workflow of how to train a neural mass model, we start off by initializing the local synaptic parameters. Then, we plug in the values of local synaptic parameters to the neural mass model and run forward simulation to generate simulated time courses of excitatory synaptic gating variable. Then, the time courses of simulated excitatory synaptic gating variable is fed to the hemodynamic model, which converts them into simulated fMRI both signals. With the simulated both signals, we can compute functional connectivity and functional connectivity dynamics and compare them with the empirical counterparts. We can then design a class function to measure their similarity and use it to update the model parameters iteratively. We can generate an EI ratio after the model parameters are optimized. As a validation to this approach, we first apply this model to a pharmacological dataset with fMRI data to test the biological plausibility of the ER ratio estimated using a neural mass model. In this dataset, participants undergo a double-blind placebo trial in which they ingest either a placebo 
or alprazolam just before an fMRI scan. Alprazolam is a sedative drug targeting benzodiazepine receptors located at GABA-A subunits. Alprazolam enhances inhibitory activities, which means that EI ratio should be lower in the alprazolam session compared with the placebo session. And indeed, in this EI ratio contrast, where we take the EI ratio of placebo minus EI ratio of alprazolam, we see that all the values are positive. This means that the ER ratio estimate is higher during the placebo session than the aprazolam session, which is consistent with our hypothesis. What is interesting is that the ER ratio contrast is the largest for sensory motor regions. We next compare the ER ratio contrast with the spatial distribution of benzodiazepine receptor density measured using PET. And correlate the ER ratio contrast with benzodiazepine receptor density. There is a significant positive correlation, suggesting that the EI ratio estimate is indeed biologically plausible. Having established the biological validity of the putative marker of EI ratio, we next apply this model to study ER ratio changes during development in youth. We utilized the Philadelphia Neurodevelopmental Cohort and divided the dataset into 29 groups of 30 participants based on their age. The horizontal axis shows the age of each group. The mean cortical ER ratio is shown on the Y axis. Each dot here is a group of 30 participants. Overall, we found that older kids exhibited lower ER ratio, which is consistent with previous studies. This negative slope between age and ER ratio is observed for all cortical regions, and all regions are significant after correcting for multiple comparisons with a false discovery rate of 0.05. The reduction in ER ratio is the most rapid in sensory motor regions compared with association regions. At this point, it is still unclear whether ER ratio is indexing biological maturity or just an epiphenomenon. If ER ratio is an index of biological maturity, then among children with the same chronological age, lower ER ratio should be associated with better cognition. To investigate this, we divided the PNC cohort into 14 pairs of age-matched high and low performance groups. So each red dot is a group, and the horizontal line connects a pair of low and high performance groups. Observe that each pair has very similar age. On the other hand, the low performance groups have consistently lower cognitive performance than the high performance groups. We can then compare the estimated ER ratio between high and low performance groups. Here I'm showing the mean cortical ER ratio average across the entire cortex. Consistent with our hypothesis, the high performance groups have lower mean cortical ER ratio than the low performance groups. If we zoom in to examine the regional differences of ER ratio. Interestingly, this effect is the strongest for higher order transmotor regions in the control and default networks. The association between cognition and ER ratio was significant for all cortical regions in the PNC dataset after correcting for multiple comparisons. Therefore, even though ER ratio declines more quickly with age for sensory motor regions, but the relationship with cognitive performance was the strongest for association regions. This result was also replicated in the Gusto cohort from Singapore. So far, I have shown a framework to estimate ER ratio using fMRI with a specific design of the neural mass model. However, the model can be expanded depending on the exact research questions. For example, instead of modeling the inhibitory population as a single unit, it can be further divided into different inhibitory neuron subtypes. For instance, inhibitory interneurons can be divided into parvalbumin, 
somatostatin, or a vessel active intestinal peptide expressing neurons. Or the model can be modified with an additional neurotransmitter system so that we can model the dynamics of the neurotransmitter along with cortical activities. Or we can integrate the model with subcortical components. Here is an example of incorporating the thalamocortical pathway as part of the neural mass model. Although neural mass models can provide us with mechanistic insights, however, the computational burdens when optimizing the model parameters can be high especially when applying it to the whole cortex. So is there a way to infer ER ratio with a relatively lower computational cost? So with that, I'll introduce the other approach, which is a time series analysis that can be used to estimate ER ratio based on the temporal features of fMRI data. Let's start by looking from the frequency domain. It is well known that the power spectrum of brain activity is following an approximate one over F shape where F stands for frequency. For example, in ECOG recordings, the power is inversely related to the frequency in a log-log scale. And 1 over F-like power spectrum is indicative of a rhythmic brain activity that does not contain a predominant temporal scale, hence the term scale-free. An important feature of time series with scale-free dynamics is its long memory properties where the serial statistical dependence or autocorrelation decays more slowly than an exponential decay. This scale-free properties can be observed across different modalities. For example, in fMRI, the power spectrum follows a similar pattern of 1 over f shape. Previous studies have shown that EI ratio can be inferred from the slope of power spectrum. In a macaque monkey study where two macaques received propofol, which is an anesthetic that positively modulates the effect of GABA, therefore lowering the ER ratio, the slope of the power spectrum is more negative during the anesthesia than being awake. The slopes of the anesthesia session is significantly more negative than the awake session, suggesting that a lower ER ratio is associated with a more negative power spectrum density slope. The slope decrease is the strongest in frontal and temporal electrodes, which is consistent with previous studies spatially locating regions of effect of propofol. Coming back to the time domain, similar to the slope of power spectrum density, Hurst exponent also examines the long memory characteristic of time series, and Hurst exponent can be directly computed in the time domain. Generally speaking, a low Hurst exponent suggests that the time series shows little persistence this means a high value in the past is more likely to be followed by a low value in the future. Similarly, a higher Hurst exponent indicates a higher persistence in the time series. Just as the slope of power spectrum density can be used to infer ER ratio changes, Hurst exponent can also be utilized for this purpose. In this 2020 study, a drug clozapine N-oxide, or CNO, which targeted a dread receptor to increase the excitation, mice received either a drug or sham injection. If receiving an injection of drug, mice should exhibit a higher ER ratio compared to the sham injection. Each experiment session can be divided into three phases, baseline phase, transition, and a treatment phase. Hurst exponent can be computed based on a section of the bow time series with a sliding window. Before any drug injection, or during the baseline phase, there is no significant difference of the Hurst exponent between two different conditions. However, during the transition phase, where the drug starts to take its effect, the Hurst exponent drops faster for the drug condition than sham. The overall Hurst exponent is also lower for the drug condition than sham, suggesting that a lower Hurst exponent indicates a higher ER ratio. Finally, during the treatment phase, phase when the drug is thought to have its optimal effect, the Hurst exponent is still significantly lower under the drug condition than sham. Overall, this is, shows the changes in ER ratio can potentially be inferred from the time series features of fMRI data. In summary, a balanced ER ratio is critical for healthy brain function.
but challenging to measure in vivo in humans. There are a variety of available tools to estimate EI ratio using fMRI data. For example, neural mass model, time series features, for example, computing a Hurst exponent. And as for the applications of EI ratio estimation, we can, for instance, in investigate the effect of EI ratio changes due to pharmacological manipulation and answer the questions how EI ratio changes over development. And how is ER ratio related to cognition? And of course, there are many other possible applications. With that, I'd like to thank all our funding sources and support. And shout out to all the members from Computational Brain Imaging Group, as well as our amazing collaborators. Thank you.